So we're going to look at all the various things that we can do. There are various behavioral treatments we can do for patients and this may apply perhaps a little bit more to overactive bladder but it can apply to all types of leakage and we're going to get into the overactive bladder. That's the bladder that doesn't hold things compared to the sphincter. We're going to differentiate treatments in a couple of minutes. There are various things that you can do because some people will leak if they hold their urine for too long. So you might be better off. How can you improve things? Well, whether you have the urge or not, maybe you just say, I'm going to go to the bathroom every two hours and stand there and pee. And maybe that's the break point where you won't have leakage. Um, you can try for people who have this urge, this overactive bladder, urge suppression. We say don't hold your urine, but in this case, sometimes urge suppression will help modify this gotta go, gotta go thing. We're going to look at various fluids. I see a lot of patients in my practice who pee a lot. They pee, 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 pee. Well, that's because they drink too much. Not only do they drink a lot, I'm going to show you what you should drink and what you shouldn't drink if you have one of these bladders that is irritable. Patients are trained to do Kegel exercises. A lot of men, or all, virtually all men who have prostate cancer surgery, have been instructed on what to do, but you've got to do them properly. Kegel exercises don't mean just when you pee, you squeeze and stop and start your urine. You must have a routine, and it's basically almost like a 10 to 15 minute routine every day where you stand and you contract your pelvic floor muscles and hold it for 30 to 60 seconds, just like I'm squeezing now. Then relax, do it again, and do that five or six or seven times in a 10 minute period on a daily basis. That's what a proper Kegel exercise is. Not as many patients are told to do is when you pee, stop the stream and start the stream and start the stream. It's the Kegel exercise has got to be done with a proper routine. So an overactive bladder, we talked about the different types of incontinence and we're going to now look at, and a lot of patients, a lot of men, and this applies to women of course, and it was always thought that the gotta go, gotta go, the overactive bladder, which is defined as severe urge to go, accompanied by urge incontinence, that's incontinence or leakage with the urge to go, going a lot, getting up at night, it was always thought to be the domain of the woman. However, we have now learned that 30 to 40 percent of men have actually got an overactive bladder, and that may contribute to some of the leakage that you see following prostate cancer surgery, which some people will try to blame on the sphincter, but in fact may be an inherent overactive bladder. And how do we know this? Well, we basically know about overactive bladder in men by looking at men who undergo prostate surgery for benign disease, like a TUR, the old ream job, the TUR prostate. We know that 30 to 40 percent of men, after they have the obstruction removed surgically for urinary symptoms, not for cancer, but for benign enlargement, are still left with frequency and urgency after the prostate. So relieving obstruction still leaves symptoms, which means that there's a bladder problem. The basis of treatment, and this goes back to people following prostate cancer surgery, because you can basically tell if you don't have urgency before you have your leakage, you probably don't have an overactive bladder. So if it just runs out and you have no warning, it's probably a control muscle problem. But if you're getting the urge and then you leak, you might have an overactive bladder. And there's a whole pile of medications on the market, which some of you may have been tried on. I don't know, but I'm going to go through them briefly as part of the talk, which basically treat this bladder that doesn't 
hold things properly that's irritable and overactive. They basically relax the smooth muscle in the bladder through suppressing nerve transmission to the muscle. And so all the medications are listed. Here in the province of Ontario, as we all know, and a lot of you here are or some are over the age of 65 and you've got the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan whose sole goal is to keep costs low and not give you the best medication necessarily. Um, so the only drug that's fully covered if you've got this problem in Ontario is oxybutynin, which is the old ditropan. And I'm not going to ask how many people may have been put on that. It's fully covered and I'm going to show you why you shouldn't use oxybutynin in a second, even though the government has, this is the only, we've tried to get it off the formulary, but it's the cheapest one, it's gone generic, so they keep it on. The next four pills are all on a limited use code, which your doctor can just write and get it. These are all very specific for the bladder, and they're basically all the same. Um, some have been around longer, so the market leader is Detrol LA. It's like Viagra, it's the Coca Cola for overactive bladder because it's been around the longest. There's a new one called Toviaz, which is the son of Tolteridine, which is not yet covered by the ODB, but probably will be soon to replace Detrol, which appears to be superior to all of these for lessening leakage episodes. And there's something neat which called Botox or botulinum toxin, which is an actual injection into the bladder, which costs $500 a shot. But it has now been approved by the government for bladder problems which are secondary to spinal cord injury. Within the next 6 to 12 months, we are anticipating coverage for overactive bladder in patients who have failed medications. There is an evolution because it appears to be very effective. So that's what we use to treat this overactive bladder component, which a lot of people are tried on following prostate incontinence, whether or not they have urge or not. This is say, well, we'll put you on the medication, we'll see if it helps. Uh, but you really need urgency as a component of your symptoms to predict whether that's going to help. I mentioned oxybutynin, so if any of you are prescribed oxybutynin by your family primary care physician or your urologist, you should tell him, and you can be intelligent, what is this going to do to my M1 receptors? We talk about muscarinic receptors. I'm going to explain this to you in a second. There are seven muscarinic receptors in the body. M3, 4 are in the bladder, so the pills I showed you, they block those receptors. Well, there's a receptor in the brain called M1, and it's been shown that oxybutynin, the one I told you not to take, crosses the blood-brain barrier, binds to M1, and leads to confusion, change in thought processes, etc., like that, and it's well recognized. There's one oxybutynin that doesn't, that I didn't add on the list. There's now a gel that's available, which is quite effective which doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier like regular oxybutynin and its advantage is that all the pills I showed you have dry mouth as a side effect. The gel doesn't. However, the gel is ex very, very expensive and may never be covered by the drug benefit plan because of expense.